Hi everyone, and welcome to the Millennial Revolt, an independent political talk show that seeks to bring a different narrative than the stale one we have going on right now in mainstream media. So today I'm going to be posting a video with Dr. Jill Stein, where she is sitting down and she is just talking to the basically the American voters, explaining about issues and problems that are affecting um, our country today, um, policy issues that she supports. It is very reminiscent to FDR's fireside chats. So without further ado, let's just get into this video. Hello, Facebook friends. Welcome to our third fireside chat, and it's really great to be back. I was here for the first, I missed the second. I had a couple days off with campaign trail pneumonia, and I'm really glad to say I'm back stronger than ever and raring to go, and very excited about tonight's fireside chat about um, disenfranchised groups and about how our campaign is helping to lift up the voices of frontline communities. And, you know, these are truly frontline communities that represent the heart and soul of America and the real struggles that most of us are grappling with in one way or another. This really should not be uh, marginal and a footnote in the campaign. Actually, these issues aren't mentioned by the other two candidates, but they are front and center in our campaign, and they should be front and center in this presidential dialogue. So with that, I want to give a big thank you to uh, Jamie and to Elizabeth, who are here from uh, Northampton, Mass, to help with this fireside chat tonight. So take it away, Jamie. Great. Thank you, Jill. Such an honor to be here. Um, the first question is from Wendy Albright, and she asks, Dr. Jill Stein, in what way do you think the Obama administration's lack of response to the pleas of Standing Rock, Standing Rock water protectors has helped escalate this oppressive situation? And what do you think of Hillary Clinton's cold comments and the lack of responses from Johnson and Trump? Great question. What's going on at Standing Rock is really a convergence of many crises that we are facing. It's really kind of the struggle of our era. Uh, it's a struggle for our climate, for our water, for our land, for human rights, uh, and for democracy, because they are all on the firing line at Standing Rock. And the courageous indigenous brothers and sisters who are leading that struggle are leading the fight for us all. And I urge everyone to support that struggle in any way you can. If you can go to Standing Rock, go there. It is an amazing, transformative, uplifting experience. Um, my two days there were just so wonderful and exciting, and I'm so grateful for everything that's going on there. It's really a universe apart. Uh, it's a very different kind of world. It really is what community is about and what the future is about. Um, the struggles that they are fighting for um, you know, are really for us all. And the uh, indifference of the other campaigns to this struggle speaks volumes, especially about Hillary Clinton, because there's an illusion out there that she represents our interests on the climate. Pay attention to what's going on at Standing Rock, uh, because it really tells you what the uh, next four or eight years will be like under Hillary Clinton. We know she supports fracking. Uh, she was really dragged kicking and screaming to oppose the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, you know, she's probably faking it on the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Her director of transition is a big booster for fracking and for the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is essentially a violation of all public health and environmental and worker protections and, and democratic sovereignty in and of itself. Uh, Hillary is on the payroll of the fossil fuel companies. So it's no surprise that, uh, you know, she's backpedaling madly. And her statement uh, said absolutely nothing. And it essentially said, oh, let's just respect everybody's rights here, you know, including uh, the rights of the, of the workers to do their job. Well, there's more at stake here than a job. Uh, if that job is violating the human rights 
of the indigenous people and mowing down their sacred sites uh, and putting the water supply for 14 million people at risk and destroying our climate, which cannot afford one more pipeline, especially not a major pipeline carrying very polluting, climate damaging Bakken oil, the worst kind of oil that there is. Uh, this isn't just, you know, a question of workers doing their job as opposed to destroying the planet. No, that's not okay. There are other ways to provide jobs for workers that are better for the workers too, because in fact workers uh, in the fossil fuel world uh, are really putting themselves and their health very much at risk too. So we got better solutions out there uh, that work for us all, that create clean renewable energy. We call, in fact, for 100% clean renewable energy by 2030 and for an emergency jobs program so that nobody's losing their job in the course of saving the planet, our water, and our climate, uh, and our human rights. Uh, we can protect them all. So I urge people, stand up, don't drink the Kool-Aid here that uh, Hillary Clinton is somehow going to protect the planet. Uh, Donald Trump, you know, uh, he supports this pipeline. He has uh, good friends who are part of it. His um, his likely uh, uh, energy secretary is uh, related to the uh, the pipeline industry and its and its network. In the case of this uh, Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, Gary Johnson, you know, he supports the energy free for all, and Hillary. <clears throat> you know, uh, talks with forked tongue, but don't believe it for a minute. Uh, she has not stood up. In fact, she refused to meet with the delegation from Standing Rock that traveled over a thousand miles to come to her office to plead for her support. Her campaign refused to allow them in, and they refused even to take a letter from a 14-year-old uh, indigenous girl from the encampment. That's how concerned they are about what's going on here. You know, Hillary the, is the queen of corruption. Uh, we've seen now in so many ways. And she's not here for us. She's here for the profits of the oligarchy that uh, is sponsoring her. So right. stand up, vote for your future, vote for our lives, and don't be fooled for a minute that the lesser evil is going to save us. Thank you, Jill. I have a question from Lynn Balaton. She says, Jill Stein, in a participatory democracy where citizens are directly involved in formulating and forming the policies of the country in all levels of government, it is important to have an informed citizenry that will make informed decisions. Unfortunately, we are currently incapable of this type of political configuration as there is a massive propaganda apparatus, the mainstream media, that operates to disorient, divert, and essentially marginalize the citizenry through, through deception, ultimately subverting the population into voting against their own interests. What's happening now in this election? With this machinery in place, I believe it is impossible to have a meaningful form of democracy. How would you and Ajumu Baraka leverage your executive powers to dismantle this machine? So, um... There are a couple things we can do, and, and let me just say that if we had the honor of serving in the White House, it would be a very different political landscape. First of all, there would be a groundswell that would get us to the White House, and we would continue to work with that groundswell to be the engine of our democracy, because we the people are supposed to be instructing our representatives how to represent us. Right now, they take their marching orders from the lobbyists. So it would be a very different political landscape. It could be a very different political landscape if people say they've had enough. You know, after these latest revelations of Trump, the sexual predator, and Hillary, the queen of corruption, and, uh, you know, with her husband running uh, Clinton Inc., with these, basically, the convergence of the economic and political elite in the form of Hillary Clinton. You know, the American people don't like this, and they're actually being intimidated into um, uh, basically manufactured consent, uh, in the words of um, Noam Chomsky, I think, who originated that phrase. So they're really not being fooled, even though the media uh, is trying to browbeat people into you know, drinking the Kool-Aid. People are you know, fearful. They're fearful. And 
that has to be fixed in and of itself, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But in terms of the problem you point out, which is really important, how the media is in collusions with uh, corporate America and the corporate political parties, that can be fixed, and there are two very uh, important things. One is that, and this is within the power of the president, so this is, you know, as you refer to executive power, the president can actually use the antitrust laws that we already have and instruct the Department of Justice to break up the conglomerates of the big media corporations. Media is consolidated now into the hands of, you know, four or five major mega corporations that have big money interests at heart. So the president can uh, instruct the Department of Justice to break them up, to take them to court for violating antitrust law. That's really critical so that we can have a press that's serving people, not serving profit. Uh, secondly, the president can actually instruct the Federal Communications Commission to, um, and, and can make appointments appropriately also so that we can begin to take back the public airwaves. We own the airwaves that are used by private corporations rent-free. We don't even charge them rent for the use of our airwaves for their enormous profits. We can begin to take back the airwaves and insist that the use of public airwaves comes with certain obligations, like that they need to provide free airtime for qualified candidates and for public interest purposes. The minute that happens, then uh, money in politics uh, you know, sort of ceases to rule the day. Money in politics is very important because it enables candidates to buy media and to buy advertising. But if every candidate had equal access to public time, then the money wouldn't matter and the public airwaves would actually be used on behalf of the public. So those are two very important um, inroads that the president can make that can make a huge difference. And the second thing, or I should say the third thing, which is somewhat independent, it's not really about media, is about this fear thing and breaking the stranglehold of that fear. Uh, and I'll just mention that we, uh, we can have a voting reform called ranked choice voting. It lets you rank your choices. So when you walk into the voting booth, instead of just voting for one person and kind of rolling the dice in the way that people feel like they have to and they're calculating, well, if I vote the way I want, am I going to help the guy I don't want? You know, they have to perform this crazy calculus for which there really is no mathematics. You know, we should be able to bring our values to our votes and bring a moral compass to democracy. If democracy is just a question of who do I hate the most and who do I fear the most, um, you know, that gets us exactly where we are now. This politics of fear has delivered everything we were afraid of. All the reasons you were told you had to vote for the lesser evil because you didn't want the offshoring of our jobs, the meltdown of the climate, the massive bailouts for Wall Street, the persecution of immigrants. That's exactly what we've gotten by allowing a lesser evil corporate political party to speak for us. So ranked choice voting puts an end to that. And I'll just say, after this election, I hope you will join me in making this a major push to um, enact ranked choice voting at the state level. Uh, so for local elections, state elections, and national elections, we actually begin to liberate our votes so that we can truly bring our values and our moral compass to our democracy. Great. Um, here's a question from Katherine Morrison. Jill, I have a chronic condition that can be improved if insurance would cover treatment. I did not know until I came down sick that our current health care system would be part of the problem instead of the solution. While many suffer, insurance companies make billion-dollar profits. I also understand that insur insurance companies are in the back pocket of Washington. I know it takes more than just the president to change things, but if you were president, what would you like to see changed? Well, we deserve health care as a human right, like virtually every other developed nation provides for around the world. Nations with far less resources and riches and wealth than what we have. And in fact, they spend far less on health care. 
and they have far better results, we are way down on the food chain of, uh, of healthcare systems because we're putting our money into profit. It's about 25% of your healthcare dollar right now that doesn't go into healthcare at all. It actually goes into administration and into profit and into paper pushing and bureaucracy. We can clean that all up by adopting a Medicare for all type system where the overhead is more like 2% instead of 25%. The other thing that this do, does is it stops the massive escalation of healthcare costs. You may have heard uh, just last week that the costs of Obamacare, the premiums are going up 25% in the next quarter. This is just like staggering that is such a huge hit because already people who have Obamacare can't use it. People who have health care cannot afford to actually get health care because they can't pay the co-pays and the deductibles. So, you know, this is not working at all. We need a Medicare for all type system which will stabilize the cost. It doesn't cost us any more. It simply redirects our health care dollars into true health care so that we are uh, providing a health care system that's about people and our health and not about profit. Kelly Minaldi asks, Dr. Jill Stein, does a single-payer system mean the government covers everything? I'm not sure if I want to be that dependent. I would like to see a plan that mixes it up. I prefer my independence. I wouldn't mind paying $25 to $200 a month for health insurance with copays so long as I had no deductible. But over 200 is excessive. I agree. But I, but I worry about how the government paying for every piece of my life. We need help, not full dependence. I was hoping you could expand on this. So let me just say that it's not government that's paying for health care. It's we, the taxpayers, who are paying for health care. So we pitch in according to our ability. You know, you could say the same thing about school. You know, uh, we shouldn't be dependent on government for school. But it's not government, it's really, it's, it's community. It's us as a collective, as a common good. Um, you know, and healthcare is something that other countries provide as a, as a basic human right. So, you know, or, or like the fire department, you know. Should everybody have their own fire department? Should you have to pay, uh, you know, a, a monthly premium uh, in order to have uh, coverage against fire or police for that matter? Uh, you know, or, or, or school. They're just basic rights that we need as a society. And let me also say that your health isn't just your concern. It's actually everybody's concern. Because if you get sick, it puts everybody else at risk also for getting sick. If you have, you know, a, an infectious disease, everybody else is at risk for getting that too. So there's really a strong collective component to health. We need to be healthy together we can pay for it together and it turns out that's the only way to make it affordable is to get rid of all this tracking. I don't know if you've been in the hospital lately but I can tell you because I was just there. You wear a little wristband you know and every time you get a pill like a Tylenol you know or, or a breathing treatment or uh, an x-ray everything is getting inputted into this enormous monster of tracking the minutia. And it's about 25% of our healthcare dollars that goes into tracking the minutia. Well, if instead of tracking the minutia, we just had one healthcare system, because they have to find out who's your healthcare, who's your insurance company, what do they cover, at what doses, how much do they cover, what's the copay for it? You know, it's just all this nonsense. It's make work for bureaucrats and administrators. It doesn't contribute to your healthcare. Instead, we need to be putting our dollars into health care and um, streamlining the insurance system so that there's just one insurer, everybody's covered. That way the cost massively goes down from 25% to 2%, and we can put our dollars into the health care that we need and that we deserve. Another question from Perla Flores. She asks, Dr. Stein, I am an immigrant from Mexico and I have been here for over 22 years. My parents brought me here as a child, and I can finally cast my vote for the first time ever this year. It's exciting, yet terrifying. I don't want either Hillary or Trump to win, 
and electing another voice does put me in distress. But I also want my vote to vote my values, not my fears. You say you will create emergency jobs, but what about the quality and options? I definitely feel like people should have a chance at doing something they love rather than just following the money. We, as one of the richest nations, have high depression rates, especially with women and women of color. And with men, it is underreported, too. Economic stability is important, but how do you see us strategically coming out of this funk? Great questions. And I think your intuitions are really right here. There is a connection. There's a deep connection between our psychological health, our spiritual health, our sense of community, our sense of economy. Um, you know, who is this for? If it's always for some, you know, uh, oligarch, some, you know, some big businessman who's just trying to extract every dollar out of your labor and maximum dollars out of our environment. If we're in an economy based on a predatory uh, pursuit of profit, it's just, it's destructive to everybody, not just to our economy and our jobs, but our state of health and our sense of who we are as a community. So we have, um, really at the core of our platform, we have a program called a Green New Deal. It's an emergency jobs program, but it's more than that. It's also an emergency program to end the crisis of the climate. And it creates jobs in clean energy, in a healthy and sustainable food system, so that we're supporting local farms and small family farmers and farming cooperatives instead of this industrial agribusiness, which is making the planet sick, making the farm workers sick, and making we the consumers sick as well. Uh, and this plan calls for public transportation. It calls for restoring our ecosystems, which are essential for our health and our economy. Uh, and it also calls for essential services like teachers and uh, home health care aides and senior care and daycare and things like that. It's not a giant cookie cutter program from Washington, D.C. It would be funded nationally as an emergency jobs program, sort of like the Obama stimulus package, but it would cost less than that, actually. Um, and, but in this case, the decisions are made locally so that people get together in the community and they decide what kind of jobs they need in order to be sustainable economically, socially, and ecologically. So it actually brings communities together to put our heads together and decide what it is that we most need to meet these guidelines for sustainability and for clean energy and a healthy sustainable food system and all that. And then it provides subsidies and incentives and low interest loans for small businesses, for worker cooperatives, for nonprofits, and for government jobs as the employer of last resort. So it basically creates a diversified economy. It's like the antidote to NAFTA, which took our jobs overseas. Instead, it creates an enormous incentive and provides funding to actually reestablish those jobs as small community-based enterprises, which is the really healthy thing, not just for our economy, but also for our sense of community, because the big, you know, uh, multinational corporations, you know, they're anonymous, they're not about place, they're not about community, they're about taking the profits and running, whereas small local businesses and cooperatives, that's all about keeping the money locally, where it recirculates, where it creates far more jobs than just that one uh, job created uh, by itself, Money that recirculates creates a whole lot of other jobs and stimulates the whole economy. So this is a, um, uh, a springboard into communities that make sense, that are coherent, and where we the people are coming together to democratically make the decisions about uh, the kind of community and the kind of world that we want to be. We're coming up on five minutes left. So, Thank um, you. We have a few more questions. Um, this one is from Kelly Martin. 
and she says, Dr. Stein, what do you think about the NATO nations currently moving troops and equipment to Romania and Poland? From what I understand, Russia is basically going to be surrounded. Yes, and in fact, Russia already is surrounded. And I just want to point out that what's going on now is sort of like the Cuban Missile Crisis that we had back in the 50s, or I think it was 1960. This is like that in reverse, but much bigger, because it's nuclear weapons, it's missiles, and now it's troops that are conducting war exercises on the border of Russia. So, you know, it's no surprise that Russia is feeling uh, somewhat defensive. Um, there used to be this idea that the U.S. had to dominate the Middle East, and we saw how well that's working out for us, um, and that we had to dominate Russia and China and all that. One of the guys who originated this thinking uh, is named Zbigniew Brzezinski. He's been an advisor to presidents for, you know, more than you can remember. I, I mean, the guy is like... Um, he just keeps going and going. It's incredible. He must be well into his 90s, but he's uh, sharp as a tack. Anyhow, he's sharp enough to realize that this policy of U.S. domination has been a disaster. And he's recently, he was like one of the original neocons, and he's come out and he said, that doesn't work, and that we need, uh, we need to approach the 21st century as a collaborator, and we need to work in partnership with the other uh, countries of the world. Uh, this is not just about being the dominator. And I'll say one more thing about this. That was when Germany reunified um, and joined NATO. The United States made a promise to Russia, uh, to uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, who was the leader of Russia at that time. And they said that the United States would not move one inch to the east of Berlin. The U.S. and, I'm sorry, and NATO would not move one inch to the east by way of just sort of maintaining uh, parity and not threatening uh, the uh, security of Russia. Remember, Russia's been invaded many times throughout history, and it's been absolutely devastating, like you know, in the Second World War, being invaded by the Russians. So for a whole lot of reasons, Russia is historically uh, sensitive about troops closing in on their border. Russia and the U.S. have 2,000 nuclear weapons on hair trigger alert, Hillary Clinton wants to start an air war with Russia uh, over Syria. That's what a no-fly zone is. It's declaring war on countries that have airplanes in Syria, which Russia was invited under international law. Like it or not, that's what international law says. So Russia legitimately has its airplanes in Syria. And uh, Hillary Clinton wants to declare war, war with Russia. So we are playing with fire here. In fact, Mikhail Gorbachev, the former leader of the Soviet Union, said about two weeks ago that we are at the most dangerous nuclear weapons moment in our entire history. So think about that. And think about whether you want Hillary Clinton sitting in the White House with her finger on the button. I know I don't. I don't want Donald Trump in there either. But, you know, we do have other options. And the more votes that we have, the more powerful a case we can make that, um, you know, we are the opposition party as the Democrats and Republicans merge into the new corporate uh, Democratic Party. Um, you know, we, we are the alternative. And it's very important for us to make as strong a showing as we can in this election so that we can be a very vocal and empowered resistance on behalf of a sane foreign policy based on international law and human rights, on behalf of a jobs program with good living wage jobs for everyone, health care is a human right, and canceling student debt, uh, bailing out the students like we did for the crooks on Wall Street. We can find a way to do that for Wall Street's victims. We can have an America and a world that actually works for all of us, but it's important not to drink the Kool-Aid, reject the propaganda that the lesser evil is going to fix this for us. We are the ones we've been waiting for. And getting to 5%, that magic number, uh, makes all the difference. Your vote counts hugely. You can get us that distance. We seem to be close. Your vote can make the difference in getting us to 5%, which ensures that we will have $10 million in the next presidential race and that we have ballot access automatically in most states. So we will become then uh, undeniably 
the party of opposition and we can hit the ground running on day one after this election to start fighting uh, these fights that need a political voice if we are going to make progress for people, planet, and peace over profit. Okay. We're running out of time. Um, I think we only have one more minute. Okay. So well, I'll, I'll go down to um, one more question for, for Jill. Okay. And this last question is from Darlene Elias. Great. And Darlene says, Jill, I want to thank you for using your resources and money to build a movement. Can you talk more about how important obtaining 5% of the vote is for the future of the Green Party? Also, what do you think should be the top three priorities for building the Green Party? Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. And thank you, Darlene, for all that you've done as a super-powered Green Party activist and candidate uh, in Holyoke, Massachusetts. So, uh, big, big cheers for, for Darlene. Um, so, let me just underscore that the 5% is a game changer. It means that we have funding and we have ballot access and we have a legitimacy that cannot be denied. You know, most Americans are tearing their hair out at these candidates that they've been intimidated into voting for. These are the most unpopular and untrusted candidates in our history and a majority of people are clamoring for uh, a new independent political party. The Green Party is the only party that is not uh, controlled by corporate money, by lobbyists, and by a super PAC. So um, I urge you to stand up, cast your vote for your values, tell your friends your vote makes all the difference. Get us to that 5% and we will have a very strong momentum coming out of this race in order to fight for peace, for justice, for uh, climate stability, for immigrant rights, to cancel student debt and all the rest. Uh, in terms of the issues that are most critical, you know, they are really in that list that I just named. I would say it's the Green New Deal because that's both the jobs that we need at living wages for everyone as well as a transformative solution on climate. Um, the foreign policy that we need, we need to end these catastrophic wars that are devouring over half of our discretionary budget and which are costing you almost half of your income taxes. But what are they doing? giving us failed states, mass refugee migrations, worse terrorist threats. So most people don't know how much this is costing you, but this is costing you enormously, aside from you know, uh, creating the chaos and making us more endangered, not more safe. Uh, so that's a major pillar, because then we can take that money, downsize our bloated and dangerous military budget, and put hundreds of billions of dollars into true security here at home funding the things that we need. And uh, for number three, we, we need to cancel student debt. We need to bail out young people. This is really the stimulus package of our dreams. Uh, if we bailed out the crooks on Wall Street, we can bail out the students, and there are many ways we can do that. Instead of funding an entire new generation of nuclear weapons, which is costing us a trillion dollars, and which is utter descent into madness, instead of funding a new generation of weapons, how about instead we fund a generation of students and get them out of debt? Let's fund the people, not the nuclear warheads. Um, uh, that's one way we can pay for it. We could also put a small tax on Wall Street, and that would generate hundreds of billions of dollars a year. That could also bail us out. The problem here is not the technical solution. The problem is simply that of standing up and flicking the switch in our own minds from power less to power full. In the words of Alice Walker, the biggest way people give up power is by not knowing we have it to start with. We have it. Just the number of people in student debt alone, 43 million. That in and of itself is enough to win this election. If word got out that millennials can come out, millennials and Gen Xers in debt can come out and take over this election and win it to cancel debt, to make higher education free, to create an emergency jobs program that will solve the climate crisis and that will transform our foreign policy so that it's based on international law and human rights. That is actually within our reach. We do have the power. Getting to 5% is a huge leap forward. So come out, vote, tell your friends, stand up and vote for what it is that we deserve and really what our lives depend on. 
Don't throw your vote away on a failed two-party system. Invest your vote in the transformative social movement that we have together. We are the ones we've been waiting for, and together we're unstoppable. So go to jill2016.com, uh, make a contribution tonight, um, help us get past this last leg. We need to get the word out. Your contribution can help us do that um, and spread the word because um, the times they are changing in a very big way. Let's make it happen. It's in our hands. Thank you, Jill. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you and good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.